I am Michael Tiemann. I am the project lead for OS Climate, and I'm going to be talking today about the WITNESS integrated assessment model and, and the open source underpinnings of that model. I want to start with a little bit of good news, bad news. My scratchy throat is not due to COVID. I got four negative tests in the last seven days, so it's not that but it's something else, so I'm just gonna speak softly, and if you need me to repeat anything, just catch my attention and I'll be happy to clarify. So, without further ado, back in the 1970s, Peter Norhouse had came up with this idea of doing something called an integrated assessment model to try to model complex economies based on all their different components, having feedback loops across how they generally function. But in 1992, he took all those ideas, reduced it to code, and released a model called DICE. And this allowed for big picture, big ticket items like GDP statistics, population statistics, uh, government policies, et cetera, to feed across an engine-like model of the economy and the energy system, land systems, and climate, and come out with predictions for economic outcomes and emissions, et cetera. This DICE model was one of the first models to really show in an economic and environmental way the potential risks and dangers of global climate change, and he used this to advocate for putting a global tax on carbon. We all know that that did not happen. Uh, many other things did not happen, but this work from 1992 was very, very important at trying to really quantify the kinds of trade-offs that policymakers today are confronting. Now, if we look at how that model has been used over time, this is a graph where on the left-hand side, we see a whole bunch of bubbles that are moving up in this nice geometric curve, and this shows the correlation between energy use and GDP. And we see a very tight coupling that as we use more energy, we get more GDP. Now, what policymakers have largely done is they have published an ambition where we can completely decouple the energy system from the GDP. And what we see here are four different international agencies with their own thinking about what the economy would look like if we could just magically change <laughs> our economic output completely independent from a pegged energy system value. And I think that anybody in this room can understand just how wishful this thinking may be. And one of the challenges that we as citizens of the world face is that policymakers are giving us their answers, but they're not showing their work. They're telling us we have big important names and we have many important scientists doing all this work. It's too complicated for you to understand, but trust us, we are going to you know, more than double GDP output without any incremental change to energy, and that's the green line or the blue line or the cyan line. Um, it's, it's really just a line. <laughs> so earlier this year, a very great articulation came out in the op-ed section of the New York Times where Professor James Mencken talks about the public having a fundamental right to science. And I don't need to spend a lot of time here at an open source conference promoting that as an idea, but I just want to let you all know that all the things that have made open source so successful are coming into the climate world and recognizing the importance of open data, open source, open science, et cetera. And the fact is that because the consequences of our policy decisions will come to all of us, if we do ultimately believe in that enlightened system of a democratic and meritocratic world where we all try to make rational, informed, self-interested decisions, we really, really need access to the science to really understand what we're talking about. We started the OS Climate Project back in 2019 under the Linux Foundation to try to collect like-minded individuals from the financial management community, from the data provider community, from the risk assessment community, from the regulatory community, from the economic community, the NGOs, 
uh, university research folks. And the three pillars are building an open source community that is expert in all these different subjects, creating a data commons or a data mesh where we are able to curate a library of public and private data sources to allow people to make informed decisions based on uh, universal data. And then finally, global data and analytic tools. That's all explained on our website. Don't have time to go into it. What I do want to do, though, is go back to a paper I published back in 2018. I tried to capture the progress that open source as a concept has made in the minds of Nobel Prize winning economists. Back in 1989, when I founded the world's first open source software company in Palo Alto, California, people thought it was crazy that anybody would pay money for free software. In fact, our tagline for the company was, we make free software affordable. Now, as much as people love to argue that this would be economically non-viable, I was convinced, my co-founders were convinced, that not only could we make this work, and you all know the end of that story, um, I, I actually believe that the first economists to actually properly articulate the economics that could be read through open source would win a Nobel Prize. And two years later, uh, uh, Ronald Coase won the Nobel Prize for the theory of the firm. The question that he answered was, if the free market is so great, why should people even do business with companies? Why don't you just go to the market? Now, if you think about open source, if open source is so great, why should I go to a company to get support and development and services for open source? Why don't I just go to the market? Well, the theory of the firm explains that answer. And that was the 1991 Nobel Prize. In uh, 2009, two Nobel Prizes were given out that refined that thinking. Oliver Williamson talked about how to value a firm, and part of that valuation model was based on long-term contractual value. So Oliver Williamson said, pay no attention to the instantaneous revenues and profits that a company might report on a quarterly basis. Pay much more attention to long-term contractual revenue. Anybody know what the most popular and successful model is for monetizing open source? It's software subscriptions. <laughs> What's a software subscription? It's a long-term contract <laughs> that stipulates that value precisely. So in a way, successful open source companies are idealized valuators of the open source. And Eleanor Ostrom, not to be forgotten, also did a great job talking about community governance as something that Econ 101 has been conveniently ignoring since proposed by the Chicago School, which said, Chicago School said, there's public and there's private. And because they're rivalrous and because we love the privates, the public stuff is bad, so let's crush the government and let the privates run everything. And Eleanor Ostrom said, oh, wait a minute. There's a third thing that's actually different called community governance. She gives a bunch of examples, including open source, and says, you know what? This third way is actually essential for certain very important classes of problems. Good stuff. But the progress continues. In 2018, two people shared the Nobel Prize in economics. One who did a really good job of essentially quantifying what Thomas Jefferson wrote a long, long time ago. And I'm just going to read out this first sentence. He who receives ideas from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper, that's a candle, at mine, receives light without darkening me. Thomas Jefferson imagined that knowledge was something whose sharing really benefited all. And Paul Romer actually won the Nobel Prize for showing exactly how knowledge is an essential ingredient to long-term sustainable growth. And he wrote this great essay, the year of that Nobel Prize, where he concluded the essay by saying, the more I learn about the open source community, the more I trust its members, the more I learn about proprietary software, the more I worry that objective truth might perish from the earth. 
we're not going to talk about that. I just want to give you like some high level uh, aspirational things. We're going to talk about Dr. Nordhaus and integrated assessment modeling. So the challenge that we have today, when big policy uh, decisions have to be made, whether it's the, the US government, whether it's a local municipality, whether it's uh, the European Union, what have you, they're challenged at multiple levels. There are inconsistent data reports. There are inconsistent opinions about what the data means and how to combine it. There's no consensual strategy for overcoming the transitional uh, uh, factors that come into play. If, if we're going to move to a more energy efficient system, how can we move people out of big SUVs and into efficient railway systems? There's a whole bunch of people who say, oh, don't want people riding the train. That will make them socialists. But fundamentally, we have a whole bunch of people disagreeing about just about every aspect of the system. And that makes progress difficult. Now, I'm going to take you off on a little journey. Back in the 1970s, some of you may have heard of this thing called ARPANET, <laughs> which later became the internet. But um, back in the 1970s, Dan Lynch was a manager who was trying to connect uh, the AI center at SRI with other uh, uh, DARPA-sponsored projects. And, he, and to, uh, according to this particular story, those connections were not 100% reliable. And as he dug into it, he, dug, he found that people had some pretty inconsistent knowledge. People had some pretty inconsistent opinions. People had some pretty inconsistent ways of building that system. In 1986, he convened a workshop with a goal of explaining what TCPI was, what it was not. Let's get everybody all working together on the same page. And by 1988, the interest in this was so great that he decided to actually convene a convention uh, at the Santa Clara Convention Center. Uh, it had 5,000 people attending, 50 vendors, including IBM, 3Com, Cisco, and Sun. I was actually living in Silicon Valley in 1988. I moved to go to Stanford University th at that time. And I remember that thing happening in, in, um, in the Santa Clara Convention Center. And some of the people who were players in that space later joined Cygnus uh, on, our, um, on our development team. But that thing became interop. And the thing that got everybody connecting really well was an event called the Connectathon. And the goal of the Connectathon was to uh, be the one who could connect their own device to as many other devices as showed up there. So people would build their TCP IP toaster and see whether or not you know, they could get 200 status or 500 status <laughs> as they talked to Cisco routers or 3Com switches or, or what have you. Interop uh, was hugely successful through 2001 when both the dot-com bubble burst and TCP had basically won. So what if we could create a connectathon for economic modeling and decision making? So that's an idea. We have a small number of people here in the room, but I hope you socialize this idea. If we're going to have people making literally trillion dollar investment decisions, wouldn't you want those investment decisions to be based on more consistent data, more consistent modeling, things that you can understand, that you can argue about, journal articles that you can read and judge for yourself so that we're really building a meaningful consensus as opposed to delegating it to three and four letter acronym international agencies who don't show their work <laughs> and come up with super unrealistic answers. So that's the big idea. And you're gonna see this graph again, but I wanna give you a chance to just sort of absorb what is the complexity of this integrated assessment modeling. And what you can see here loosely is that a population provides a labor force that, uh, uh, that is an input to a macroeconomic model that looks at various energy demands. Uh, it has some regulation that sits on top of it. It produces emissions. It needs materials. Uh, it uh, it uh, both produces and supplies, uh, produces and requires energy. There's an environmental system 
that's looped in. There's a natural resource system that's looped in. There's finite materials. There's a lot of wonderful electrification plans that fail only because there's not enough copper on earth to implement them as written. So what's the alternative? You know, we've got to find an answer to how we uh, can electrify without going through, you know, without being resource limited in that way. There's the energy system, which has an energy supply, R&D, uh, various types of fuels, et cetera. So all these complicated things fit together, not unlike what you saw with DICE, but it gets a lot more interesting, as I'll show in a second. In our perfect world, an open source transition analysis tool helps clear up the question of inconsistent or incompatible data, and it also provides a critical mass of actors with common frameworks. Think TCP IP working as opposed to a whole bunch of different proprietary network protocols not working. Collaborative elaboration of transition strategies, ways whereby uh, people who are most expert in their particular topics can work together across various technology bridges so that their high quality components can feed into other parts of the modeling system that are also high quality in their specific regards. And then finally build a largely accepted and followed pre-competitive strategy. So I think all of you know that at the Linux Foundation, one of its great contributions has been to show corporate America, not just corporate America, the global corporate community, how companies can work together without violating antitrust laws. And one of the ways to do that is to build a pre-competitive layer, something that works for everyone but does not specifically attempt to displace specific products uh, in, in any way. So we're building this as a framework. We're also building this as a tool. And, um, and we think that this can help change that game. The presentation that I am giving was given by Capgemini at a conference a couple of um, months ago. I made some mods, which you'll see. But they spent a lot of time doing a demo, which I would love to do, but I don't have time. So you can click on this QR code. The slides have all been uploaded. If you want to see the demo, you can go see the demo. And it keeps getting better every week. There are uh, dozens of check-ins, dozens of Git commits every week. It keeps getting better. But lots of cool graphics, lots of cool stuff. Let's go and focus now on a specific aspect of this economic model. In current integrated assessment models, population and health aspects are very poorly addressed. That's just a fact. People are giving short shrift to help health. And so we can look at um, what, what policy decisions we might be shortcutting or short circuiting with bad health information. And we can compare different IAM models and see why witness is good and other stuff is bad. But let's zoom in on this a little bit more specifically. We can see that there's a coupling uh, when we think about health between population and because of the labor force, how it connects to macroeconomics, but also how it connects to how the environment influences health and ultimately influences mortality rates or disability rates. So here's our picture focused on just a relatively tight circle. So the, the, the witness team actually went to look at a whole bunch of health literature. They grabbed a whole bunch of pages. Down at the bottom of the deck, we've got lists to the, to the literally scores of public policy papers. But uh, to, to keep it really simple and short, we can model population based on what is the birth, you know, what is the birth rate based on all these interesting factors. Uh, what is the death rate based on these interesting factors? And uh, what we can see on the bottom right-hand side is, for example, how many additional deaths are caused in what parts of the population based on well-known diseases like under, undernutrition, malnutrition, malaria, dengue fever, diarrheal diseases like cholera, heat waves. And so we know from the science just how uh, devastating these things can be to segments of the population. And depending on which segment gets hit, 
that's going to have knock-on effects to the population, to the labor force, to the economy, and we can map all that out. And that's kind of cool. So there's a demo focused on health, and you can see as assumptions about the prevalence of, say, dengue fever as the climate warms up and the dengue uh, uh, conditions are wider and wider. This is going to have an effect. It's going to bend population down. It's going to bend GDP down. Uh, social welfare is going to go down, all sorts of other stuff. But again, if you want to see the demo, you got to go to the demo. So I thought it would be a really great way to explain to the Linux Foundation audience, let's, let's look at something that nobody likes to agree on, which is COVID data. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a lot of people with a lot of opinions about whether it's real, whether it's serious, you know, whether we're in or we're out of a global pandemic. As I said before, my scratchy throat has made it through four negative tests in seven days, so I don't have it now, but I don't want to get it tomorrow. I went and I looked at statistics from the National Institutes of Health and the CDC and some other places, and I found a study that basically said the effects of long COVID are going to result in this level of disability through the workforce over time. I saw data that said COVID is going to result in this many excess deaths at these age levels uh, over time. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting for me to publish my two sources and to introduce a new dynamic of a disease curve, put it into the model, and just see what it's like. How, how easy is it for me, somebody who's never been inside the source code before, to write some fresh code <laughs> and put a pandemic model in and then watch the curves bend up or down depending on this data. And so I did that. And uh, that was pull request number seven. And uh, uh, about two weeks after I started doing the work, having never seen anything, the developer said, thank you so much. This is really wonderful. So if I can do it, look, I'm turning 60 this year. <laughs> so if I can do it, I'm sure you guys can do it. In any event, um, there's one little slide just showing the particular pull request. And then, <coughs> most importantly, here's the data. So here's data from my favorite sources, and I cite them down there, uh, showing what is the disability rate per age group. Now, the working population does not include zero to four-year-olds, right? The GOP has not got that happening yet. So. <laughs> So we have sec sectors of the population who may get COVID, but it doesn't immediately take them out of the workforce. But what this model allows us to do is to say, based on this prevalence of long COVID disability, this is what's going to happen to the population and, and therefore the GDP. And similarly, there's a mortality rate. So we plug all these variables in and we connect the dots and we get some answers. Now, the point of this is that you may have a different source of data that you believe more. You may think that the US government is full of crap and you really believe the Canadian government or you believe the French government or you believe you know, the Germans or the New Zealanders or, or whatever. But having the ability to select your own data sources um, and, and actually what the tool allows you to do when you're running the model, you can go to the pandemic parameter data frame and you can say, I want to upload a new file. <laughs> that file that you were using from Michael Tiemann, don't like it. I'm going to put my file in, and I'm going to see how that affects stuff. And it's helpful, I think, to all of us to recognize that many of these parameters are not sharp black and white things. They have their effect over time. You know, sometimes a few percent makes a big cumulative difference. Sometimes it makes almost no difference, and you won't know until you go through the math. And I'm going to show you how exciting the math is in a second. But maybe health is not your thing. Maybe you're into disasters. You're into physical risk. You want to know, gosh, what if my economy is actually much more susceptible to heat, to drought, to flooding? Uh, the witness guys are, are, are strongly looking at how can we begin to build models of physical risk damage 
into this and, uh, and, and see those effects ripple through. Or, um, you know, maybe you're also interested in how uh, there's knock-on effects between how climate change increases the relative action of these events. I don't know if you guys saw the video footage out of Dubai this morning. Holy cow, holy cow, they got a year and a half's worth of rain in four hours. I've been to Dubai, it's, it's kind of a dry and hot place. The, uh, the amount of scouring of the streets, I mean, you see a, a street is 30 feet deep with the, <laughs> with the main sewer lines completely exposed. That, that's gonna have an effect on productivity. That's gonna have an effect on uh, global trade. Anyway, uh, so, so physical risk is a, so we can look at climate-induced death models. We can look at how is human labor impacted by climate change? How is capital loss affected based on climate change? So capital loss, the capital investments is part of that macroeconomic function that says, do we have the investment capital need? It's kind of like, that's the oil that keeps the machine running. The, the human labor <laughs> is kind of the, the fuel that keeps the machine running. But we can, we can put all these different models together. Again, health, physical risk, climate, knowledge, uh, human uh, capital, et cetera. And the, um, the community is, is absolutely interested in talking about this. But as I said, uh, you could be up and running with your own model in two weeks if you want to. A little shout out to the math wizards. One of the people who is contributing to the um, witness project is a contributor to the GEM SEO project, which is a math library. And I'm, I'm a level of math nerd where I can see stuff that's really cool and say, that's really cool. <laughs> but I can't really do the math. But let me tell you what's really cool. What's really cool is that the math available in 1992 is one reason that DICE had very limited coupling and very limited capabilities. In 1998, some people figured out a whole bunch of new stuff doing Taylor, experience, Taylor series expansions of complex analytic numbers and using complex Lagrangians and complex Jacobians are able to actually do much faster and more efficient gradient following as they optimize all this coupling. So I showed you that graph that had sort of seven bubbles all connected with each other. When you actually start putting all the variables together, uh, today or this morning, I counted the couplings in the model with COVID. There are 244,000 couplings in that whole model. And the COVID stuff is part of it. Uh, the energy system is another part of it. But because of all this advanced math, this, you can crack problems on your laptop or a relatively well-configured server that was sort of inconceivable back when Nordhaus did DICE in 1992. So I think that's really cool. So if you're into complex math, there's the link for you. And so to sort of summarize, here's, here's what it takes to become a contributor to Witness. You develop your core model in Python, you wrap your model in a way that allows for the automated coupling of parameters. So there are dictionaries with well-defined terms. And so when I'm bringing my COVID model in, I have to know how to get to the population discipline. It's called population discipline. <laughs> I have to know how to get to the climate economics discipline. It's called climate economics <laughs> discipline. And you link your model with these large level hooks, and then it automatically discovers how to make all that math work so that as it's running down all the answers, uh, everything is being properly calculated. And so here is the example of doing some more stuff with health. Down on the right-hand bottom, you see a, a graph of couplings. <laughs> and I can actually bring up this, uh, let me bring this up. Yeah, so here's a, here's, here's, here's my graph. And this is just one, this is a single level of, uh, of coupling here. But when we look up the interfaces, <coughs> I 
which are all the little variables. This may take a little bit of time. We'll just we'll let it run in the background, um, but it's exciting. Oh yeah, there's the pretty math. We're not gonna look at that. We're gonna look at, oh, where'd my presentation go? Here it is, sorry about that. Back to here. So um, that's great. And when it comes to getting it scientifically accepted, there's a pretty well understood process of doing validation at every step, working your way to the top. So you validate your individual model, you validate the system integration, you validate the system of systems, and then you basically you know, run it through the academic and peer review platform. A lot of witness has been through this very rigorous process. It was originally developed at Airbus for the purposes of actually charting a net zero transition for Airbus uh, to build a, you know, their next trillion dollars worth of inventory on a net zero trajectory. Uh, for various reasons, that whole group got sold to Capgemini, and so they're, they're doing all their work there. But uh, they, they do good work at getting those individual models validated, getting the systems validated, all the way up to, you know, here's really good stuff. And we're super proud that Peter Nordhaus got his Nobel Prize in 2018. But take my word for it, the level of technology in this is a quantum leap ahead, as many open source projects are. And that's another reason that you might find it fun and exciting to work on. So. Here's a little map for how, as a user, I don't think many of you are professional economists, but if you are, that's your column. If you're a developer, you're, uh, there's your map on the right-hand side. And ultimately, and this goes back to open source economics, there's a whole lot of cool stuff we can do purely out of our own self-interest, scratching our own itch, doing our own thing. That's the left-hand side. But for people who really want to get some commercial support. There's a whole group of people whose job is to help make that happen, whether it means bringing transition analysis capabilities into an organization, doing professional co-development, uh, or other things like that. And so, the invitation I offer to all of you is let's go and build a universal integrated assessment model for climate, and let's give the policymakers something to think about. So that is the short version of the presentation. I know we only have 40 minutes, but I wanted to leave some time for Q&A. And so I am super happy to take some questions or maybe, uh, maybe my pretty graph is finished and I can show you, yeah, my pretty graph is finished. I can show you all those, all those variables. And you might say like, what variables? Hold on, how do I, come on. There it is, yeah. So we can look at, you know, here's the carbon capture discipline. If you believe in carbon capture, some of us don't. But here's all the stuff that goes into that. And by the way, the system uses pint uh, to handle units, which is super important because all kinds of things happen in all kinds of unit spaces. We don't want another Mars rover disaster where people take imperial units, mix them with metric units and crash the economy. So. We do, a, we do a good job, we do the best job we can of maintaining unit visibility and consistency. So any questions that you might have? Yes? I may have missed it, but where do you feed in the actual climate science in terms of the natural science? Yeah. Climate Super, I'll show you. So if we go to, here's a particular mo <coughs> model. And here's data management. So these are the sort of the fundamental data inputs. And we can look at, um, let, me, uh, let me see if I can find the thing that I wanted to show you. Um, there it is. So here's the table of pandemic parameters. And what we can do, this is currently in read-only mode, so I can't, uh, I can't change that. But what I can do, come on you, why is that not? Ah, I have lost the handle. Uh, if we switch to addition mode here, then it can become writable. And so what I can do is I can upload fresh data into a fixed thing. But if I want to do my own model, for example, maybe, maybe I'm a person who's really big on converting automobile travel to railway travel. And I have some statistics. I looked up some great statistics in Japan about 
how, what is the emissions per passenger kilometer, uh, what is the actual density of passengers over time and stuff like that. So I, I could figure out how, how do I land a transportation module that takes capital investment and time and some other things and gives me a transition model and how does that improve uh, worker productivity, how does it decrease emissions. That is the build a model step. But to your specific question about where do the economic parameters come from, they, they come from a set of tables that are built into the models. And let me show you a, a short list of, of um, I think it's actually at the very end of this presentation, uh, I have a list of our, there it is. So here are the general data sources being used. And all of the models within Witness come with documentation that lists the specific data set down to the DOI. So, um, so you can find the source code references to all of those specific papers that describe models and data sources that feed the models. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, it is a constraint problem, exactly. Yes. Yes. So, so the concept of integrated assessment modeling is to make all that quantifiable. And as I said, so the DICE folks were able to build relatively simple models. You may or may not know this, but the people who won the Nobel Prize in economics for correctly predicting temperature rise from 1970 to 2000, they used 1950s um, uh, modeling. They, they split the earth into pretty large tiles. They used 1960s generation computing technology. And in 1970, they published a prediction that basically was absolutely bang on in 2000. And so in, I think it was in 2017, they won the Nobel Prize for a pretty primitive model. The DICE stuff is pretty primitive. What is so exciting about Witness is it's like orders of magnitude more capability if you want to go there. So today, and I think I mentioned this earlier, today, Witness is based on a global model. So we take big global numbers like the world GDP, the world population, and we assume some internal transfer variables like there is transportation. But we don't really talk about China to the US. We really don't talk about you know, the pipeline across Europe or whatever. We just say there's this transformation, I'm sorry, transportation, trust us. The work that's going on right now is to build a much more detailed sector model. So right now they have like services and manufacturing and agriculture. And we're delineating much more, oh, this kind of manufacturing or those kinds of services or this other kind of agriculture. So that we can look at when you change your diet to meat-based to plant-based, what happens to land use? What happens to nutrition? How many more people die from undernutrition or overnutrition? So sectorization is one thing which is underway right now, and regionalization is underway in about a month or two. And by the end of the summer, we should have a, a nicely delineated thing so you can, you can look at North America, you can look at Europe, you can look at Asia, you can look at the global south, and you can sort of see how much does trade really cost us? <laughs> how much does it really benefit us? And you don't have to take people's word for it that, oh, it's all good. Great question. So as far as biodiversity loss is concerned, <laughs> the World Wildlife Fund has done amazing work to try to quantify bio, uh, the ecosystem services of the natural environment. So for example, mangrove forests in Louisiana deliver this much benefit, but as they continue to die, this many more coastal communities are impacted and there's all these other negative effects and so forth and so on. Um, 
we, the witness model does not yet have all that good stuff in it, but if you're into biodiversity and ecosystem services, you could build a model where you're both offering, here are the values of the natural, that the natural world is offering you in terms of uh, free fresh water, free fresh water. Uh, and if you don't have enough fresh water, then you have to desalinate, which is a different system over here, and you need energy for desalination, and you've got salt disposal, which is its own problem. So you can go and you can start building a model that looks at water, or that looks at forest, or that looks at those other things, just like I did for COVID. So I think we may have time for one more question, but we're right, we're right at time. So if there's a burning question, great. Otherwise, I'm going to be going through some of the unconferences, and I'm doing a clim uh, an open source climate landscape uh, unconference. I think it's at 255. So you, if you want to talk in more detail about climate-related data and analytic tools um, as an unconference, uh, it's it's going to be very audience-driven. Any last questions? Go for it. Oh, actually, in the back. No, no. These are uh, these are global. So the World uh, World Bank. The IEA is the International Energy Agency, uh, the World Bioenergy Agency. Uh, uh, this, is, this is all typically international data. And if you don't like these data sources, find your own, plug it in, show the world, you know, let us see the world through your eyes. All right, thank you so much.